From the campus of Yale University, this is Business Talk with Jim Campbell, nationally syndicated across the country on the Biz Talk radio network and coming to you from our flagship stations, Yale Radio, WYBC, and 1490 AM, WGCH, Greenwich. All talk and all business, 60 minutes of radio with leading figures from the world of business along with the business of politics and sports. Joining us from London is Bradley Hope, reporter for the Wall Street Journal covering finance and malfeasance, of which there's apparently a fair amount of. He spent six years as a correspondent in the Middle East where he covered the Arab Spring uprisings. He was detained by authorities in Bahrain, reporter from the front lines of the Libyan Civil War, tear gassed in the Egyptian Arab Spring uprising, and he's the author of The Last Days of the Pharaoh on the Final Days of Egypt's President Hosni Mubarak. His co-author, Tom Wright, is a Hong Kong-based correspondent for the journal. He was one of the first journalists to arrive at the scene of the raid in which the Navy SEALs killed Osama bin Laden. And together, their new book is The Billion Dollar Whale, The Man Who Fooled Wall Street, Hollywood, and the World. Welcome from London, Bradley. Thank you very much. Happy to have you. And by the way, we specialize in whales. We got the first interview with the London whale who lost $6 billion for J.P. Morgan. And now this is The Billion Dollar Whale. And we're going to be able to jump right into some breaking news. But first, tell people um, who and what is the billion-dollar whale to begin with. So the billion-dollar whale refers to this young um, Malaysian financier called Joe Lowe. He just turned 37 years old the other day. Um, And at the time, uh, his peak, you know, during the the period that our book's about, he was in his late 20s and early 30s. And he was this kind of no-name figure um, who is now a a big-name figure that was behind what U.S. and other investigators believe is one of the greatest frauds that ever was pulled off, um, where they basically siphoned away uh, upwards of six billion, five, six billion dollars from this sovereign wealth fund. And all of the money that was stolen was actually borrowed money, money that Goldman Sachs, Sachs helped Malaysia borrow. And um, it's having these endless ramifications, in, including, you know, the, the Malaysian government uh, has changed and there's been all kinds of impacts. And we're going <clears> to <throat> go through those. Uh, the breaking news is that um, Goldman Sachs had uh, let go of the managing director, the partner that was uh, in charge of this relationship and brought in all these fees, Tim Leisner, and kind of positioned him as a rogue guy. Well, Leisner's testimony has now come out. Um, and, and maybe you can take us through it. It does sort of implicate Goldman. He's been a little bit of a darker character for us, darker in the sense we didn't really know his full story. And what happened was he was put on leave, you know, um, when the one MDB scandal kind of blew up. And they found that he had written this letter that was unauthorized, and they it gave them a reason to sort of essentially fire the guy. And at the time, it didn't seem like that big of a scandal for him. You know, he... He wrote a letter he wasn't supposed to write, and, and it wasn't even clear he ever sent the letter. But it, but over time, things have bec- things have started to emerge that gave us a clearer picture. And and last week was the the ultimate moment in that in that kind of clear clearing picture because he pleaded guilty to basically being a key participant in this in this fraud and and from the very beginning. So from like from the beginning of this one this Malaysian fund, he was getting money in an offshore account, paying it in bribes to other officials, and, and he pled guilty. And so it's, it's really just, and it was an incredible moment. And the, and the ramifications keep coming for Goldman because in, the, in some of the court documents from the Department of Justice, they mentioned, well, he mentions other people like Goldman knew about this was going on. Um, one of his underlings is also under arrest in this, in this case. But, but, and then another guy... Uh, was was put on leave because he was essentially, without naming him, mentioned in this in in, in Leisner's plea, saying that this guy knew about it as well. And then the, the latest news that come out was that um, Lloyd Blankfein, the the former CEO of Goldman, met this Joe Lowe character on at least two occasions. He says uh, in this testimony too that he admits to evading the internal compliance uh, and, and committees at Goldman Sachs. But he said that was the culture of the firm. That's a pretty big indictment. Yeah, there's that. That's in there. That's, that's language. That I mean, very clearly, what's going on right now is that Goldman and the Department of Justice are also having talks between between themselves, as Goldman the bank and the Department of Justice, about what kind of a fine they might have. And 
and it's, it's quite interesting if you if you talk to lawyers who read this complaint, uh, sorry, this this where 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 license pleading guilty, the the the, the Justice Department's language very clearly um, indicates that they they believe they could um, they could charge Goldman Sachs as a bank with a crime. Wow! Like the the way the language they use is the exact language of the law that allows you to take. Um, you know, some sort of wrongdoing, and then apply it to the parent company or to the bank itself. And we've seen so it's the, pretty serious. Yeah, we've seen in the past that if you indict criminally a bank, it often means it's over with. <laughs> it's hard to imagine that to be the case here, yeah. but it's definitely going to be a, a major black eye. You know, one of the biggest black eyes they've had since the financial crisis, and it's probably going to cause a lot of. Um, efforts inside Goldman to kind of prevent this kind of thing from happening again. I mean, I, I don't, I, we don't know yet the full the full outcome. Well, Brad, let me ask you this, though. Um, uh, clearly, uh, in your book and before this came out, that Leisner's positioned as a rogue kind of guy at Goldman, and they fired him and everything. Uh, would they, wouldn't they have known um, that that would, was going to backfire if it wasn't true? Because he's what's going to get out and, and let himself get hung alone, would he? There's, there's obviously the best evidence is about one guy doing a particular thing. And the hardest evidence is to prove that people higher up have yeah. any knowledge of anything. Um, I think that that's, that's actually not the test because there is, there is just so many opportunities that Goldman had to detect that this guy, Joe Lowe, was heavily involved in all these deals. And, yes, um, Leisner lied to people and told them he wasn't involved. But mm-hmm. if anybody was doing their – if anybody was doing, like, just a – an ounce of proper due diligence on these deals, they would have, they would have known something was up. Even one of my favorite ones is that one MDB, and so basically one MDB was controlled by Joe Lowe from behind the scenes, even though he didn't have a role there. Everyone kind of reported to him, mm-hmm. and and because he had this relationship with the Prime Minister of Malaysia, and this fund was his was the Prime Minister's fund, and and so one MDB told Goldman, look, when we raise this money, um, the billions of dollars. We want you to transfer it to our account in this tiny Swiss bank in <laughs> Switzerland. It's a, it's, a, it's a bank called BSI that was really just a, a, well known for catering to Italians who had an account in Switzerland. It was not a major commercial bank, you know. Mm-hmm. Goldman made, and this just blows me away, six hundred million dollars uh, off of uh, transactions for MDB, floating these bonds, etc. And uh, not not only is that number unbelievable, but I'd be willing to bet that the government ends up getting most of it back anyway. Yeah, yeah, that that's true. That, that's the other thing because, in, in one way, if Goldman had so Goldman did basically three bonds. There's there was yeah. a, a grouping of two in the beginning and then one later, and those bonds, um, you know, the, the first bond had that same sort of a profit margin for Goldman, mm-hmm. and it, it would be reasonable to assume that they had sort of. Managed to, um, you know, dupe Goldman into, sorry, dupe One MDB into into doing something that was really expensive the first time. But then to do it two subsequent times, they it would just show there's something funny going on here. Like what kind of a fund, what kind of a fund would would raise um, three and a half billion dollars, pay three hundred and fifty million. So that's the first two bonds. Mm-hmm. Or pay three hundred and fifty million dollars in fees to Goldman, <laughs> and then. And then, and then what they did was they, they transferred $1.4 billion. This is like all, you know, apparent in the paperwork to this other entity to just hold like, as a collateral. And, you know, and it turns out that money was stolen. But there was just a lot of features to these deals that just didn't make any sense. And it's hard to believe that Goldman thought that this was all perfectly above board. The um, fact that uh, Joe Lowe appears to have taken – Five billion dollars. I know the first move was seven hundred million, but by the time he was done, um, is that? I mean, how do you get that kind of money out of a sovereign wealth fund in the first place? And is this level of corruption or even a lower level typical of these wealth funds? Um, so, so it was over over many different deals. You know, so each deal. So, like this, the first ever deal, for example. He he set up this thing where it was one MDB was going to do a joint venture with this this tiny Saudi company. It looked like a big Saudi company, but it turns out it was a very small Saudi company. The, the, it was a, a it was a deal where one MDB was going to give a billion dollars and they were going to contribute their their, their supposed assets. Mm-hmm. And um, so this, this is just the simple like brazenness of it. When when it came to transfer the money, 
they transferred 300 million of the billion to the actual joint venture, and the other 700 million they just sent to this uh, this um, entity that had a, this this offshore company in the, in the Seychelles called Goodstar. So there there it was, just in the matter of days, 700 million dollars was gone. You know, and and so a, a lot of the actual uh, siphoning was like that, almost kind of like crazy and brazen. Mm-hmm. Most of the work that Joe Lowe was always doing and that, that has been detailed in a lot of these court filings is covering up these, these holes. And, um, and the, your question about corruption and sovereign wealth, I, mm-hmm. mean, it's, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of it around the world, but there's just nothing quite like this. Attention small business owners. Growing your business can be tough. Just when you thought you were making money, you found out that you owe the government money. And now that you owe the IRS their cut of your business profits, you may be broke. And if you don't take things seriously, you could go to jail or have your business shut down. But you do have an option. If the IRS is threatening you for unpaid taxes, call the Tax Resources Network. Their tax professionals and ex-IRS agents have over 23 years of experience dealing with the IRS, saving business owners and the self-employed millions in tax dollars. Let us negotiate with the IRS on your behalf. We may be able to reduce your tax debt for a lot less than you owe, help with the IRS audit, and even criminal investigations. If your business owes the IRS $15,000 or more and the IRS is threatening you, don't wait and let your business get shut down or worse. Call for a free consultation. Call 800-910-4980. 800-910-4980. That's 800-910-4980. Again, 800-910-4980. Joining us from London is Bradley Hope, reporter for the Wall Street Journal. This this is really, I don't don't think this is like an indication of what's going on out there. This Mm -hmm. is just the craziest, most unsustainable um, kind of scheme that I've ever come across. Because, you know, uh, we often joke, Tom and I, about if they had just kept, if they had just stayed with the first billion, they would never have probably gotten caught. Because the reason that that all of this has come out is because 1MDB, became saddled with so much debt. Yeah. It eventually rose to almost thirteen billion dollars of debt. And and it had it had no no like um, savings from the country of Malaysia. <laughs> it had it, it didn't it didn't have any disbursements from Malaysia like their like most sovereign wealth funds would have would be the savings of the country from their oil sales or something. Mm-hmm. So because it was so unsustainable the whole thing just kind of came tumbling down and then and all these investigations started and, and that's kind of where they are. But it's just to me mind boggling. I mean, you would think if you want to steal some money out of a billion, you'd take, you know, 50 or 20 million. But to take 700 million of the billion and think nobody's going to notice that uh, he was like 27 years old when, when he did that deal, I think, when it first started. And you call him a serial fabulous. What does that mean, by the way? Well, basically, from a from a young age, he was he was kind of telling stories to people that weren't really true, you know, mm-hmm. So he 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 told friends that he he was richer than he was when he was in when he was in this kind of uh, very high end British boarding school, and he just kept telling stories. I mean, in a way, he's he's kind of a, he's a serial fabulous, and he's also like the greatest stage manager. Hmm. He he would he would kind of pull you aside and whisper something to you, and you felt like you were getting to know the, the truth of something, and and only later, maybe years later, do you realize that. He was doing that with everyone, and he was telling them each a different story. You know, so he he was always he had this uh, uncanny ability to figure out exactly what makes someone work, and to use it to, um, you know, enlarge the the scheme or mm-hmm. cover it up or mm-hmm. you know buy some more time. So, I think, and 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 the, the serial fabulous part in a way he's just he's just never really told the truth on this, about this deal ever. You know, throughout the whole course of it. And there's always this, and, and it's kind of sloppy in a way too. You know, sometimes the the story would change after the fact, and there would just be no way. But there's no way to really change the money flow. So it was almost kind of it's kind of crazy that he would even try to do that. Um, this whole thing appeared to me to be really rooted in the failure of monitoring the global uh, flow of funds, and you have money laundering, offshore banks not following laws, corruptions, 
law firms I- involved. Um, you, you, you use a figure $32 trillion of money laundering, which is bigger than the U.S. and China's GDPs. Um, is, this, is this rooted really in the, fa- in, in the failure of the system to figure out how to control these um, flow of funds? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say there's, there's kind of two levels. Okay. The more, like, micro level is that well, the, the global financial system is it kind of assumes that deals between countries, between Sovereign Wealth Fund A and Sovereign Wealth Fund B, are going to be big ticket numbers. Mm-hmm. And so when, the, when there are 700 million going this way and a billion going that way, and they're saying, no, no, don't worry, this is, this is Malaysia, the government of Malaysia's money, this is their Sovereign Wealth Fund, there was kind of this assumption that that's, you know, that's how things work. Because, you, you know, it, it's, it, I, you can imagine being the guy who's seeing these flows it would be pretty hard to imagine that someone just stole seven hundred million dollars in the course of like ten minutes, you know. <laughs> so, so that's one level. But then the higher level, I think this year it's becoming ever more clear, is that that for for, for a long time, um, all especially the Western kind of leadership countries when it comes to the global financial system have allowed this offshore, um, opaque system to get larger and larger and larger. And it, and it depends on all these different pieces, you know, offshore secrecy companies, um, you know, banks that don't do don't do proper compliance. But you know, it's just, it's an incredibly large system, and it's so big now that to turn it back, it's almost going to be a, a, a monumental task because all that money will fight the effort to to, to 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 turn things back. You know, even just I'm not sure if you see, followed this case in Europe called Danske Bank, this Danish bank. They had this tiny Estonian branch mm-hmm. that, over the course of nine years, saw two hundred billion dollars flow through it. Jeez. That they now think is probably all suspicious. <laughs> so most of it from Russia. So this like tiny branch was doing that. You can imagine what what else is going on out there. Um, what is layering? Uh, l- Larry. La- layering. In these layering. Oh, layering. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Layering is, is, I mean, basically a lot, of, there's a lot of money laundering techniques are just meant to make it harder for people who are, you know, maybe not even very well paid compliance people to mm-hmm. press a button that says suspicious. So layering is just, it's just, it's just efforts to um, disguise the origin of some funds. So it just like having a company owned by a company owned by a company so that if you want to, if you want to try to follow it, mm-hmm. you'll get lost because you'll find this company is owned by a BVI company. And, and that's in turn owned by a Seychelles company, and it goes on and on. And it even slows down law enforcement, too. If law enforcement were to follow that money, they have to file, um, you know, uh, like a legal request in each jurisdiction. And some of those jurisdictions are just not very friendly to those kind of requests. So they can, they can really slow down a lot of the, of the law enforcement actions against people like this. I was surprised also that there's a lot of laws in place for anti-money laundering through banks and stuff and reporting. But there's a thing called interest on lawyer trust – that is not part of that reporting requirement. So top law firms can actually serve as money laundering outfits. Well, I would say it's not clear that, for example, in this case, Sherman Sterling didn't know that, they, that what was going on. They didn't okay. know where the money came from. But it's 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 an, a, a gaping huge hole in, <laughs> in the U.S. financial system. That basically the way it works is these law firms originally um, created these special accounts. That were meant to, so, so let's say you have to send over, let's say you're going to buy a hotel or buy something huge. You send this money over, it's held in this account at the law firm, and the interest on that would go to this kind of charitable cause, which is the, um, you know, all these law firms, they contribute to um, paying for people to have a free lawyer if they can't afford one. That was the idea, but it turns out it's also just like a huge um, money laundering tool in some cases. And because what it, what it does is, let, let's say that you're um, some sort of counterparty in the U.S. And, and somebody from Malaysia says they want to buy something, you you get the money from Sherman and Sterling. You don't get it. For, you, you don't. Have, there's no way to even follow that money before that. So it just it it makes it basically eliminates the ability for anyone to do any due diligence on the on the buyer. And um, these these pooled accounts are just they're, they're extremely dangerous. And I think it's obviously an abuse of, of what they were meant to set up for. But that's what you find so often in money laundering is that something that had this innocuous purpose, like even the idea of a trust, you know, the tr- a trust was, I think, 
I was reading somewhere it was it was created you know during the time of the Crusades in England when people were leaving to go to war and they didn't know what was going to become of their of their assets so they created these trusts. This is Talk with Jim Campbell, all talk and all business, 60 minutes of radio with leading figures from the world of business, along with the business of politics and sports, right here on the Biz Talk Radio Network. back with guest Bradley Hope, author of Billion Dollar Whale, The Man Who Fooled Wall Street, Hollywood, and the World. And we'll show now that this guy, Joe Lowe, how out of control he was, too. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, his his becoming an overnight party boy billionaire, and whether we're talking Paris Hilton or Leo DiCaprio or yachts or whatever. Talk, uh, tell us what he did with the money. To, to the people around Joe, he was always a big spender. So even when he was in, in high school, when he was in college, he was he was wowing people with his expenditures, but it was nothing to put him on the map, right? Uh, on like a on like a you know a national or a global level, he would just spend like you know fifty thousand dollars in a casino, and it would you know people who are going to college are thinking that's the entire tuition for two years that you just you know won and lost over the course of a few hours. When he suddenly started getting this huge money, so when like for example that. One day, suddenly, he controlled $700 million, and the day before, he didn't. <laughs> he just went on this extraordinary spending spree. And, and, I, and actually, I, I just can't wait o- over time for more details to come out about this. But what we know he did was he basically showed up in New York, Las Vegas, and just started spending incredible amounts of money. You had fleets of Escalades taking him all around New York City, <laughs> going to all the biggest nightclubs, dropping hundreds of thousands of dollars a night. This wasn't even at his peak yet. This was just still, this, he's just warming up. <laughs> um, renting yachts, renting plane trips, um, then eventually starting to buy things, buy a plane, buy a hotel, you know, just starting to accumulate all these assets. He also became obsessed with um, celebrities from the very beginning. The way it works is, and, and this is why he's, he's referred to as the whale, because in, in a nightclub world, if you show up at a nightclub and you drop even even like a, a substantial amount of money, twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars, you're, you're a big deal in a nightclub. But if you start dropping hundreds of thousands of dollars, or in Joe's case, he's in he dropped it on multiple occasions millions of dollars in a single night, you're the whale. You're the guy that can make that club's numbers for the year, hmm. um, in in a, in a matter of a night or two nights or three nights. Did um so did 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 that did any of these guys wonder where this money was coming from? That he was associating with the Hollywood guys or whatever. I never, I never really heard anyone say they particularly cared. But <laughs> also, Joe, Joe kind of was always making things easy for people because he didn't want people to think, "Oh, I've, I'm getting money that's, that's possibly illicit." He was always putting people at ease. So you know, he let people think that he came from this really wealthy family and that his grandfather passed on this multi-billion-dollar fortune to his dad, and now it's. Now it's coming under his control. You know, it was all a, a fantasy, a fiction that he created to make things easy for everyone else, you know. But in these nightclubs as well, th- there's these nightclub promoters, and they, they, of course, they gravitate towards big spenders, and they want to make whatever that guy wants happen. So Joe would started going to these nightclubs, this, like, you know, 20-something young guy, kind of nerdy guy. And mm-hmm. one, one of these, some of these nightclub promoters got the impression, you know, from him that he really wanted to meet these celebrities. And so they started to arrange it. And he and he was out there hanging out with Leonardo DiCaprio not even a few months after that seven hundred million dollar um, first phase of the of the fraud. It's unclear, you know. In some cases, some of the celebrities like Paris Hilton, he was he was paying them to come to his parties, mm-hmm. um, significant amounts of money. In Leonardo DiCaprio's case, it was more that he was he was kind of promising him that he would be the source of all kinds of funding for his films. And, and that's where the Wolf of Wall Street comes in as well, because they had wanted to make that movie for a long time, but but the studios didn't want to do it. It was too R-rated. It was it was risky in their view. So in in walks Joe Lowe, saying, "Listen, me and my friends, we'll we will we'll handle that for you. We can easily do a hundred million dollar film like that." And, and Paris Hilton, he was paying a hundred thousand dollars to show up to a party. Yeah, and that's that's just like for a party, but also when these people would go, when these people would party with him, they would also get, you know, a lot of stuff. So like, for example, 
you know, you get you get like free champagne, whatever. But you also get if you would go gambling with him, he would hand you um, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars in chips just to have like to play with that night. So there's a, there is huge benefits, and then there's the gifts. You know, we we know about some of the gifts. Like um, he dated this this supermodel um, Miranda Kerr, and she got all these diamond jewels and things. But but he gave gifts like that all the time. You know, there was there was one story in the book where he was like in a in the limousine with a bunch of models and other people, and and one of them remarked that it was her birthday. So he pulled over, went into a, this jewelry shop, and bought her um, this extremely expensive watch. You know, like a fifty thousand dollar watch. So he he was just He's just so good at spending money. I mean, he was he could just spend so much more than you can imagine that he could spend. He did. Yeah. Here you have him uh, losing two million dollars in gambling in ten minutes, spending ten million, uh, two million in euros on uh, on champagne. By the way, wouldn't he have wanted to keep a low profile? That was another thing that that really kind of was his undoing as well. The you have him buying a penthouse, I think, in New York City for thirty one million dollars in cash. And this eventually goes to the prime minister's kid, right, or stepson or something, which also yeah. would seem to implicate that the prime minister knew exactly what was going on. He was a huge buyer of luxury real estate. He bought multiple expensive places in New York City, you know, like top 1%. Um, and then some of them he transferred over to this guy, Riza Aziz, who is the stepson of the prime minister of Malaysia. It's, it's unclear. I mean, I would say it's unclear that Riza knew exactly what was going on because he was told, and this has been documented, he was getting all of this benefit on behalf of an Abu Dhabi um, member of the royal family. Once again, Joe Lowe, this is the kind of thing he did. He made everyone, he needed everyone to be heavily implicated so that, that he would be protected. But at the same time, he didn't need to tell them the truth, the full truth um, of what was going on. So like even in, in, the, in that first phase of the 1MDB scandal, the prime minister we have this email where some of the guys are discussing it and they're saying, Oh, don't tell the prime minister. He doesn't really know the full picture here. You know? And I think there's a, there's definitely an element of that, that uh, that's not to say that, that the prime minister and the stepson are, um, you know, without criticism. And, and, and in fact, they're all they're at least the prime minister of Malaysia is, is being mm-hmm. um, criminally indicted in, in Malaysia and faced many, many charges for many different things. But it's not. It's not clear to me that anyone had a full view of what was going on exactly mm-hmm. for Joe Lo alone. If we go back to the macro level for a second here, I mean, is this really an indictment of us that how everything is for sale on Wall Street and in Hollywood and in D.C.? That's how I feel. I, my experience in, in researching this book has been it's kind of changed my life to some extent, where I feel like I have a glimpse of how the world really works now. I, I keep. I kept. I, I, even as we were reporting this, I kept assuming, no, no, it can't get any bigger. Yeah. They, they probably just took the first billion and the second billion <laughs> misunderstanding or whatever. But then it just kept getting bigger and more and more confirmed and Mind more and more people were involved. And, and they were involved in worse ways, like with Tim Leisner. They were, I thought maybe he was just getting paid through his bonuses, which would be pretty high mm-hmm. considering the $650 million worth of fees on the bonds, right? Yeah. So I thought maybe he just that's how he's gaining, but he was also gaining on the side. So I think... Across the board, I'm just sort of disappointed, you know, yeah. but, but I get, you know, definitely Hollywood for sale. Um, <laughs> polit- U.S. politics is not quite for sale, but you can get into the, I mean, basically under Obama, Joe Lowe was, was in, in the White House holiday parties and, and um, had all kinds of access that you wouldn't normally have. And now, and now under, under the new government, he's, he clearly believes he has a kind of cynical view because he, he hired all of his lawyers. He hired are all very close to Trump. So there's um, he hired uh, Mark Kasowitz, who is one of Trump's personal lawyers. That's his criminal lawyer. He hired Chris Christie, former governor of New Jersey. Wow. That's his civil lawyer. Wow. You know, and, there's, and there's other guys, too. Bobby Birchfield, he's one of Trump's um, ethics advisors. How cynical is it to, to hire that kind of a group of people? That that's what he thinks. That's what that's what his view of the U.S. government is. You know, um, the other thing that really hits you. I mean, um, there's just billions and billions of dollars in J Lo. Uh, Joe Lo bought his own share of these of real estate for cash, and that's really all money laundering through LLCs now, right? Any any cash per- purchase of a thirty million dollar yeah. apartment is should raise some red flags. You know? 
And the, a lot of that's gone through the Trump organization too, right? Yeah. Well, and, I mean, a lot of that—that's what—that's what these developers are in some ways. Like a high-end luxury real estate developer, it's pretty hard for them not to be at least in part a money laundering machine. Yeah. Because what, what their their biggest buyers are all foreign people from Russia, China, whatever, coming in there buying in cash. And, you know, it's, it's also, it's not even just money laundering. It's also just a safe place to stow your money. Yeah. And, and perhaps when you buy an apartment in a building, it's a lot easier than opening a bank account in New York. You can just buy an apartment and that's your savings account. You know, it appreciates potentially, you know, you don't have to go through the same compliance checks that you might if you were to open a bank account in New York. <laughs> and that was basically um, people in Malaysia that, knew something bad was going on that had done an investigation, but were getting kind of shut down. And that made that information made it way, its way to us. From there, it just kept developing, you know. So then, you know, I have this Middle East experience, so I, we figured out that not only was there a billion missing in the beginning, but there was another 2.4 billion missing in this whole other Abu Dhabi saga. So, so like, we figured out, we, we managed to get some documents that showed that the Wolf of Wall Street was funded by this money and... It just kept going and going and going, and, and all along the way, we just kept hearing more and more about Jolo, and, and that's how eventually it all came together. You know, there's all these separate things, but they all link back to Joe. Our final segment uh, coming up, the cost of corruption to a nation. Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell, all talk and all crime. The nation's biggest murderers were the go-to source for the Moxley murder of the Skakel Appeals, financial crimes on Wall Street, inside the crimes of Russia's Putin, and more. The facts, the forensics, the inside stories. From the host of Business Talk with Jim Campbell, it's Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell, all talk and all crime. Learn more about Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell by visiting Park City Productions 06604's Facebook page. That's Park City Productions 06604. Wall Street Journal investigative reporter Bradley Hope. Right now, where is this guy Lowe? Is he a fugitive from justice? What's going to happen next? Will he end up in prison? Will they get him? Well, he, so Joe Lowe is now officially indicted by the United States. He's been, he's been, um, Malaysia has sort of un, unsealed charges against him as well. So he's definitely a wanted man. There's Interpol red alert notices from the, and he's, he's believed to be in China and under the protection of China. Really? Um, the reason for that is, when this whole thing started getting much worse, Jolo stopped traveling. He, he holed up in, in um, China. And it looks like, increasingly, that he developed really strong relationships with the Chinese government and essentially helped them to do all these deals in Malaysia that, that increased Malaysia's debt to China extraordinarily. Wow. And it was, so he played this strategic role on behalf of China. And, and Malaysia used a lot of that, some of that money um, to pay down some of the debts in the 1MDB case. Because if you can imagine, Najib, um, the prime minister of Malaysia at the time, was extremely vulnerable because of this whole thing. You know, it, he was denying that any money had been was missing. And so he really needed this bailout. And, and what he did in order to get that bailout was basically do whatever China wanted him to do. So that's where Joe is believed to be now. The, um, this, this looking at the cost of corruption to a state. We, you talk about what MDB, the goal was to create jobs and, and have this slush fund on the side. But the fund debt uh, ended up being almost three times the GDP of the country. So this whole episode actually lowered the standard of living in Malaysia. Is that right? Amazingly uh, hard to understand the true impact of it because mm -hmm. all of the money that was stolen was borrowed. So even Malaysians for a long time, and even to this day, they still struggle to understand the impact on themselves mm -hmm. because it's essentially things that didn't happen. So it's hard to feel what didn't happen. If they had, if their savings had been stolen, they might actually feel worse about it. But their borrowed money, it's like, it's like your credit card debt was stolen. And so it has this kind of funny feeling where it doesn't hurt as much. But I would say it, it has had so many ramifications on Malaysia. What I was just saying about China, for example – is it, it changed China? It changed Malaysia's foreign policy, its relationship, yeah. its standing in the world. It's it's all the hospitals that weren't built, all the schools that weren't funded, yeah, sad. You know, things like that. You know. In fact, while we're on foreign policy, it it, it actually ruined Malaysia's relations with Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia, right? Because they tried to engulf them in the cover up. It definitely hurt their relationships um, tremendously, and and also probably other countries too, even its neighbor Singapore. Um, the U.S. has kind of distanced itself from Malaysia, at least during the Najib era. 
I mean, the, the, the ramifications are so huge, but they're also kind of, like I said before, kind of hard to feel for, for the average Malaysian. Do you put as bluntly as Goldman Sachs facilitated the destruction of a country wealth? I mean, I would say it, it, it's kind of factually true that that happened, but, it's, they, but not willfully. You know, okay. I think it's just they, they played a pretty important part in this whole scandal, and I'm sure they're really regretting it at this point. Do they work? Can they work? Can they fail? What are, we, are there new tools needed? How would you wrap your arms around the big picture issue? These things are, are great because if, if it wasn't for the United States Department of Justice and their vigor that the, in the way they've investigated this, mm-hmm. we wouldn't know hardly any of the really amazing details of this. They have dug so deeply over many years into it, and their court filings are some of the best you know, information you can get. And, and they are, you know, bringing criminal charges against people. And then, you know, it's a huge deterrent. So that, that all seems to be working pretty well. When it comes to the bigger picture of preventing it from happening in the first place, mm-hmm. you know, I don't, think, I don't think their actions are enough of a deterrent because I'm sure there's plenty of things that get through all the time and people feel that, yeah, there's a risk, but, you know, I think we can, we can get away with this. So the, the bigger picture is just how do you get your arms around this, this whole almost like – it's almost like this upside-down financial system that is beneath the surface that involves these secrecy locations, these islands, mm-hmm. um, these small banks around the world, you know, banks that don't even operate in dollars. I mean, the, the ones that are in dollars are the ones that are kind of held to the highest standard. But then people like Joe Lowe are still operating to this day, and how are they doing it? They're not, they're not using the normal banking system, but they seem to be doing just fine. You know, he's paying his lawyer, he's paying everyone and continuing to live freely. So, I was going to ask you, does Lowe have money right now? Yeah, it seems like he has a lot of money. So he has it in some place that he's able. To, they haven't been able to freeze it or anything? I would, I would estimate that he spends much above $20 million a year on lawyers alone. He's got access to a lot of money, and there's a lot of money still missing in the 1MDB scandal. I mean, we don't really know. We hardly know where any of the money ends up, except for the money that he used to buy certain assets. But there's a lot. So the assets total like two billion, and um, you know there's six, seven, five, six, seven, and that's not accounted for. So, do you think something like the Magnitsky Act, which is designed to freeze folks' um, assets, like like Russian mob figures, et cetera, does something like that needed so that you could get, you know, you could stop the funds of the Malaysian Prime Minister or the, or this guy Low? I mean, th- that kind of thing is is good. I mean, in, there's also things like in the UK, for example, they they've got this new thing called. Um, unexplained wealth so if you if you just try to buy something in the uk with a lot of money and you can't explain where the money came from they can seize your money so they have some of the first cases coming through on that now but i mean it's obvious if you've got a hundred million dollars and you want to buy a ten million dollar house you should be able to explain where your money came from or how you earn that you know and if you can't you lose it which is a pretty crazy thing i mean that's a pretty big impact yeah so i think there's a lot of those tools but at the end of the day they don't dismantle the system that yeah. allows hundreds of billions of dollars to course through the, the dark corridors of the economy. Should, the, should this real estate money laundering uh, uh, aspect of this, should that be closed? I mean, it, it seems to me there's no, there, should be, there, should be no, there should be no obstacle for the government to know exactly who bought a particular house. And if they bought in cash, you know, that should be really heavily scrutinized to avoid this kind of thing from happening on a massive scale. Because there's so, so many cases where, where real estate is plays a fundamental role, yeah. role in money laundering. So, Do you think it would just have such a negative effect at the top end of real estate if they suddenly uh, put a halt to this? I, I, I can't imagine that it will be a good impact. I mean, it, would, <laughs> it, will, it will only reduce some of those sales. And, of course, maybe governments don't, don't particularly want to do that. It might reduce taxes and... There's probably a whole chain of people and industries that are against that from happening. All right, but, la- our last question here, the last uh, few seconds. Do you think they are going to get Joe Lowe, get the money, and will he be in j- put in jail? I think in the long run, the, 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 there will be sort of a sense of justice in this case, but I think a lot of the money will never be recovered. And it's really unclear if Joe Lowe will ever leave China. I mean, if, he's, if he never leaves China, then... There's no reason that he'll have to be arrested. And the Chinese will not uh, allow him to be extradited. You don't think? Well, yeah, that's the other that's the other possibility. But there's no there's no evidence of that yet. Thanks to Bradley Hope, oh, boy, what a story! 
The book is The Billion Dollar Whale, The Man Who Fooled Wall Street, Hollywood, and the world. And as we said, news is just breaking, so I think there's going to be a lot more on this story coming out over time, particularly if they get this guy. Thanks to Bradley Hope from the Wall Street Journal. Money, 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 money. You got to have it. When you need it, what do you do? If you don't have a rich uncle, call Lending Tree. With us, hundreds of banks compete for your business, so you'll get loans with competitive interest rates, and in some cases, with no closing costs. So here's the deal. If you need money, call us. Do you want to refinance your current loan? Are you 62 or older and interested in a reverse mortgage? Then call Lending Tree now. 888-794-1645. 888-794-1645. We've closed over $250 billion in loans. We know what we're doing and can help you. Call right now for a free quote. 888-794-1645. 888-794-1645. 888-794-1645. 888-794-1645. That's 888-794-1645. NMLS number 1136.